am going to talk about not comparing only two groups, two proportions, but then I'm going to compare several proportions with the basic null hypothesis that all of these proportions are the same. You remember, you saw the uh, Sony students, since we had the average across, that's the hypothesis that uh, that would be expressing what's going on. So, I'm having, instead of just, before I had two, actually I turned the table, uh, I transposed the table, instead of having samples on the different rows, as, as I had in my blood cloth example, I'm having samples in the column. Sorry, I hope you can cope. Instead of having only two, I'm having many. And probably I should decide whether I want to talk about K or C. Let me see. What do I use in the formulas? I use C. Good. C for columns, so that makes nice sense in English. Um, I have now C proportions. Son Studios and I had 12 different years, so the C would be 12 on that data, if that was the data, right? Now I'm going to try to tell you how could I compare those 12 proportions or those C proportions? How could I construct a hypothesis test that could tell me whether those proportions are statistically different or not? I start out, as I did just a minute ago, by computing the overall proportion, also depicted in the Son Hustilson's picture, right? The overall, where I count all the successes and divide by all the ends, or count, add up all the ends, because like for Son Hustilson, the births in Denmark, there is, there is not the same total number of births in Denmark each year that varies from year to year, so the end could be different there. We have to cope with that in our dealing. So I add up all the ends, I add up all the x's. That's what I did here, right? And I get this total p. That's the first step. The way, I, I repeat myself here, this is the joint p. Let me see. I think I'll show you this one and then I'll jump back. I did update my slides last night, so if you printed them out, uh, before last night, I'm sorry, I added in this table because I needed it there to make an explanation. Sorry about that. Anyway, uh, I didn't remove anything, I just added this table, right? I added this table here to make the point that the way I'm going to make the hypothesis test, I'm going to construct a test statistic that measures the difference between the observed data and the hypothesized situation. That's usually how we do test st statistics, right? The data compared to the hypothesized situation. But now I have a complex data structure. I have a complete table. So I construct a table of so-called expected counts that matches exactly with the hypothesis. And I compare that table with my observed raw data table. That's the way it goes. It's an indirect investigation of the hypothesis. And the way it goes is, and now I go back to this slide, the way it goes is that I take this common proportion, which for the blood clot example, blood clot example was 26%. Maybe for the uh, Sonny Stewart it was uh, 4 point something percent the overall percentage. Then I take this percentage, and that's kind of a visualizing it maybe, so I don't take it anywhere, but that's how I see it. I take this percentage and I use it in each group to look at each group and say how many successes should there be in each of the 12 groups to match exactly the same proportion, right? But the, the ends are different in the different group. So there could be different number of proportions, sorry, different number of successes to give the same proportion. Formula-wise, I, I use the word expected values. So the expected number of successes, the one is success, two is failure. 
So the expected number of successes in sample group J, and there are C of those groups, either two or 12 in the two examples I've shared with you. I multiply the joint P on the total number of births in year 998, for instance. So I take this, this, the common proportion and I multiply it by number in year, this number in year, that number. So it gives me the 12 different, how they were supposed to come out to express exactly the same proportions, right? And I both count successes and I also count the failures, although of course failures are implicitly giving. If I know the number of successes, I also know the number of failures. But just here, we, 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 pick, we look at all of them, even though you could say, I mean, if I know these, I know the others, but it's just it's part of the procedure to look at all of them jointly, right? So I make this table of expected counts. Actually, here's a rule of thumb that in case we're going to do this by hand, uh, these expected counts in a frequency table, also sometimes called contingency table, as we'll learn in a few minutes in the, out in the future, the way this idea of taking the common proportion, multiplying it to the different total ends in the different groups, the rule that comes out of this thinking is stated here. So, for instance, to find this number, just to make it a little example, to find the expected count in the success group, in sample group two, what I should do is to take the total number of successes Row total. The total number of, sorry, wrong one. Total number within sample two, column total, right? Divided by the total total, or just easier, the total, right? Uh, if I combine it, row, column, totals like that, I can easily find all the expected values, right? That's, uh, that's how it goes. It's just putting into a, it, this is a formula e easy to remember in your head if you need to do it yourself. Of course, the computer can do it for us, but if you needed to do it, that's a nice formula. The way to understand what is going on is by thinking this way, right? It's the same thing, it's just uh, looking at it two, two different ways. Here it, the test statistic now comes. I compare the Original data table, now I use the term O for observed here. It's a two by 12 data table in Sun Hysteriosen's data. It's a two by two table for the uh, blood clot uh, birth control pill study. All of those observed ones, I compare with all of my expected ones. So this is where I compare data with hypothesis. Right? By comparing these numbers. If the observed data match the hypothesis, those fixed proportions expected data, then I get a zero signal here. So there's no difference. If the, the observed is exactly the expected, then it looks nice and I should have to accept the hypothesis, right? However, the more different my observed counts are from this uh, same proportions, expected values, the higher the signal here, right? And it turns out, when I measure it like this, taking the difference, squaring them, seeing it relative to the expected count, it makes sense that a difference of two should be seen relative to what you expect. If you expect three, then a, then a difference of two is a pretty large difference. But if you expect a million, then a difference of two is not an important difference. So I'm, this is not a proof of anything. I'm just sort of letting you, I hope you can follow me, that it makes sense in a way that you see the differences relative to what they're supposed to be in a way. It turns out, and that's why it's named like this, and it's the most famous statistics maybe even out there, the famous Pearson chi-square statistic. It is named like this because the theoretical 
probability result will tell us that if I compute such a difference and look at the sums, I go through both success and failures, I go through all the C columns of the data. So I have all the two by 12 numbers are there, 24 numbers, 24 uh, um, elements of the sum of this case. If there is no group difference, if the samples are actually having the same level, the proportions are the same, then such a test statistic will behave like a chi-square distribution with number of proportions minus one degrees of freedom. That's a theoretical result that we are not even going to try to prove to you. It's not dramatically different in our minds. We square something. We know that binomials becomes normals uh, when n becomes large enough. Then I square normals. We've seen before that when we square normals, we get chi-squares. That's a, a probability mathematical line of reasoning that would lead to a chi-square distribution here. There is a rule of thumb for using this test. And the rule of thumb says now, these expected values for this test to be at all valid should all be at least five. The expected values, not the observed, remember that. The expected values should all be above five for this to be valid. Let's try in the two by two example that we started with. I need to find the expected values. So that's, in a way, that's how we can deal with it if we are forced to do it ourselves. I had the observed values. That was a two by two table, right? I just, now I add the totals to the table, right? I add the totals to the table, and then I remove the inner part of the table. Now that's a procedure I'm giving you now, right? The totals for the expected table will be the same, actually. The totals is, would be the same. Now to compute the expected values, for instance, the E22, the one that should be here, right? The expected value for the no birth control pill group and the no blood clot uh, outcome would be row total times column total divided by total total, right? Or just total. So that number would be 123.76. And I could do that three times more to get the other numbers. I will not bore you with that right here now. We could combine these and get the other numbers. Those four numbers you see here depicted as part of the chi-square statistic. Here you see the E22 number that we just found. The other three are also on the slide now. I compare those four E values with the four O values by the chi-square statistic. I get a chi-square statistic of 8.33. Is that large telling me that these are different or is it not large? Whoa, that's difficult to know if I don't know the chi-square distribution. But luckily, if I don't remember it by heart, I can always use R as I should to work with the distributions. The thing is, there are only two. So C is two here, so the right degrees of freedom would be one. Do you remember the percentile, the critical value? Well. Now you do, because I showed it to you. This is the square of the standard normal quantile, 1.96. Fantastic, right? Um, so what is the conclusion? I observe a difference between my observed two different proportions and the and hypothesized same proportion situation. The difference is eight. This is a very unlikely difference, right? I'm way beyond the critical value. So the conclusion is I reject the null, and I've definitely concluded an excess risk in the birth control pill group here compared to the other ones, right? The 40% risk is definitely statistically larger than the 20% here, for sure. I didn't find the p-value. I could find the p-value also. You can work with that yourself. Good. 
or maybe we could have a look in a minute when we jump into R. Today I plan to take the R at the end, just to not jump back and forth, uh, so we do all the R thing at the end. But before that, we need to take one more step 